of the book of Colossians. Colossians has a beautiful Christology, and there are several reasons for that that we're going to get into. But we want to cover some of the, the basic information before we actually begin to dig into the text and to give us an idea of the book of Colossians and why it was written and the people to whom it was written. Colossae in the ancient day was where modern day Turkey is. And so if that gives you an idea uh, geographically of where Colossae is, you see there the map uh, of some of the uh, modern day countries and, and where it sits in relationship to that. The closest modern city is Penarkent. And so if you frequent the uh, area of Turkey and you're familiar with uh, Penarkent, you know uh, it's close to the ancient remains of Colossae. Uh, you still can go visit the remains of Colossae. Uh, we have some of those remains there. Uh, so that has been excavated so you can stroll what were the ancient streets of Colossae. Colossae was a significant city uh, ever since the 5th century BC. Uh, but by the time we get to Paul's letter here, it be it's beginning to dwindle and it's losing its impact. It had for many years been a great uh, east-west trade route as people were traveling. Uh, it was right in the, the main thoroughfare uh, and so saw a lot of incoming and outgoing traffic. One of the significant landmarks is Mount Cadmus. And there was a pool that uh, fed by the Lycus River at the foot of Mount Cadmus. And that little pool was considered to have healing powers. Uh, and you see uh, the picture there of Mount Cadmus and the pool that was believed to have healing properties. Uh, this was on the north side of the city. The Apostle Paul wrote this during his first Roman imprisonment. Uh, Time-wise in the book of Acts, that's about Acts chapter 28. Uh, Paul writes it to the Colossians, uh, likely around 60 AD. And you see here a timeline of when some of the other books were written. Uh, for point of reference, the Apostle Paul dies about A.D. 67, and so this is nearing the end of his life that he writes this letter to the Colossians. Now, the city of Colossae would become decimated uh, in the early 60s, early to mid-60s, by an earthquake. Uh, Rome wanted nothing to do with it, but the city uh, pulled together and tried to rebuild itself. One of the major issues facing the Colossian believers at that time was the cult around Michael the Archangel. <clears throat> and you see a picture here of someone's depiction of Michael the Archangel. And you think about why. Uh, why would a city be so fascinated with Michael the Archangel? Well, you think about our own culture, probably around the 90s, early 2000s. Uh, we, as a culture, were obsessed with angels, and they happened to focus on Michael the Archangel. Now, there were some teachings that believed that Michael the Archangel was a manifestation of Jesus, which biblically to me makes no sense, but uh, some did believe that. But this angel cult of Michael wasn't the only prominent false teaching that was taking place throughout Colossae. Another one were strict rules about religious festivals and ceremonies, uh, what you could eat, what you could drink, uh, a very legalistic culture. They were also big on avoiding indulgence. Uh, they were big on their list of do's and don'ts. Uh, in other words, they, they kind of had a, a, a list of if something feels good, you shouldn't be doing it, which can be okay advice, but it's not always foolproof advice. Another issue we have here among the Colossians is a depreciating of Jesus, that Jesus is not necessarily God in flesh, that Jesus isn't necessarily the Lord. And so we're going to get into that in a few moments. But there's also a false teaching of secret knowledge. Uh, this was an early form of Gnosticism. And Gnosticism basically were there were spiritual secrets that only a select few knew. And if you didn't have those secrets, then you were outside of, of who were the truly elite ones. And there's a reliance on human wisdom. Now, there are going to be some significant references throughout the book of Colossians, specifically to the members of the Trinity. And obviously, in the book of Colossians, if we're addressing false teaching, if we're addressing elevating Michael the archangel, and we're depreciating the person of Jesus, that one of the key elements here is going to be on the person of Jesus. And if you go through the book of Colossians, whether it be referring to him as Christ Jesus, or Christ, or the Lord Jesus Christ, or the Lord, or Son, or Master, or the Beloved, Jesus is referenced 39 times in the book of Colossians. Now, 
one thing if you in your personal Bible study, one great practice is to note the frequency of words being used because there's a reason. Uh, again, in the ancient culture, ink, papyrus are at a premium. You're, you don't waste ink. Whereas today we can type something, backspace, delete, whatever, it's not a big deal. But if you're looking at a biblical passage or a biblical book and something is repeated a lot, there's a reason for that. It's for emphasis. And for frame of reference, with 39 references to Jesus in the book of Colossians by name, that's every two and a half verses you're going to encounter a specific reference to a name of Jesus. That is very significant. But you're also going to find references to God, uh, either God, God our Father, or Father, 26 times in the book of Colossians. That's every three and a half verses. So you begin to get this picture that as you go through Colossians, you are going to be bombarded with references to Jesus, references to God the Father. And there's going to be some references to the Holy Spirit, but not as many. But one of the members of the Trinity is going to be referenced every one and a half verses. That's a lot. Because the best way to correct false teaching, the best way to correct false living is ultimately to put the focus on the person of Jesus. To put the focus back on God. And Colossians is going to do this very powerfully. And I want to spend just a few moments this morning in what's really the key passage for me in the book of Colossians, and it occurs early here in Colossians chapter 1. And we'll get into this in more detail in a couple of weeks. But it says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all th things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. I especially love verse 18, that in everything he, speaking of Jesus, might be preeminent. So that Jesus in everything would have the first place. And so if you are obsessed with Michael the archangel, Paul says, I want for you, Jesus, to have first place, not the archangel Michael. If you have the strict rules regarding your religious practices, I want your focus to be on Jesus above all things. If you're obsessed with it, avoiding indulgences as somehow making yourself righteous, I want your focus to be on the person of Jesus. If you're in the habit of depreciating Jesus or not seeing Jesus highly, Paul says, I want you to see Jesus as preeminent above all things. If you are obsessed with secret knowledge and this early Gnosticism, Paul says, I want Jesus to be preeminent in your life. If you have a reliance on human wisdom, I want Jesus to be preeminent in your life. Because for the Apostle Paul, ultimately, the correction to false teaching, the correction to false living is the preeminence of Jesus. That Jesus is enough. False teaching happens when we take our focus off of Jesus, even if slightly. The moment teaching becomes Jesus plus something, you are spinning into a false teaching. Doesn't matter what that is, it could be good things. It could be Jesus plus good works. And you now have the foundation of false teaching. It could be Jesus and rooting for the Steelers, which it's great, but you've just laid a foundation for false teaching. It's Jesus, period. Once you put a plus after Jesus, your theology now has a poor foundation. Because false teaching is ultimately going to be built off of it's Jesus and this other thing. And why is that so tricky? Why is that so tempting? Because you still have Jesus. You still have Jesus as a foundation of that teaching, but you've now mixed something else into it. 
so many people get led astray because, well, it, it sounds good because there's so much focus on Jesus. But something else has been added into that. And the foundation has thus been corrupted. Even holiness, obedience. When we say Jesus plus this is what it's all about. We've now laid a foundation for false teaching. No matter what teaching we're looking at, it becomes Jesus plus something or remove Jesus from the equation. Jesus is enough to correct the false teaching by putting the focus only on him. But false living also happens when we take our focus off of Jesus. Or when, when our lives are built on Jesus plus something else. This is why, by the way, sin management ultimately fails. Because sin management becomes this issue of Jesus plus this. <clears throat> yes, it's Jesus, but it's also my self-will, my willpower, my determination, which ultimately fails. Sin management is ultimately taking that sin, replacing it with something else. Because if you never replace that desire with something else, you're going to fall back into sin. Because you can spend your whole life, and we, we, I've used this illustration before, but if, if I stare at a box of donuts, Coons has some excellent donuts, by the way, just a little free plug for them. They, they, Coons, if you're watching, you, don't, you, know, you can send a donation to the church if you want. But it's, if I look at a box of donuts, and I spend the entire, entire day saying, I shouldn't, I shouldn't. What will eventually happen? I'm going to eat a donut, right? What ultimately needs to happen is I need to get away from the box and focus on something else. And as believers, sometimes we get so focused on, I got to say no, got to say no, got to say no, got to say no, got to say no. And then we get mad at ourselves when we do. But what do we expect? It's not enough to say no. Ultimately, that focus needs to be put elsewhere. And the focus needs to be put on Jesus. Jesus is enough to correct our false living. And that false living can take a variety of ways, whether it be sin management or even an obsession with others approving of you. But you know, it's very easy to live your life with a unquenchable desire that others approve of you, that others affirm you. What's the problem with that? There's always going to be somebody who doesn't and if the focus of your life is I need people to approve of me you are ultimately chasing the wind the only correction to that is to say I am accepted and approved by Jesus and until that becomes enough you are forever going to be chasing what you can never have is Jesus enough for us are we concerned about our reputation? You know, my life will be complete, not only with Jesus, but also if, if people just respect and admire me, if people think well of me, if I have enough money in the bank, if I have a good retirement, if I have good health, all of these other things which are fine. But if we say ultimately my joy, my peace, my satisfaction, my purpose in life is connected to that, and Jesus will never have that peace. We'll always have a divided devotion. We'll always be chasing after something else until we finally learn to say Jesus is enough. Whatever I'm longing for, whatever I need, whatever purpose I'm seeking in life, Jesus is enough. And so Paul in Colossians chapter 1, out of the gate as he corrects, this whole buffet of false teaching that is infiltrating the Colossian church. It says Jesus is enough. Jesus is to be preeminent in your life. He's the one responsible for everything. And I love that little jab that all things were created through him and for him. And so all of you folks who are obsessed with Michael the Archangel, Jesus created him. So who's greater? Paul begins, and he's going to come back to this theme, and he's going to come back to the person of Jesus every two and a half verses by name. Jesus is enough. 
for our lives, is Jesus enough? For our happiness, is Jesus enough? For our joy, is Jesus enough? For our peace, is Jesus enough? For our sense of purpose, is Jesus enough? This doesn't mean that all these other things are bad. But sometimes the greatest enemy of our focus on Jesus isn't the bad stuff, but the good stuff. In the parable, Jesus talks about the weeds that grow up and choke and tangle. And it's not just the bad things in life. He talks about the pleasures of life, being some of those weeds and thorns that choke out the life of the plant. In Song of Solomon or Song of Songs, that, that it's referred to as the little foxes. The little foxes that get into the, the garden and eat up what's there. The little foxes that you're not paying attention to. What are we looking for in life? What are we connecting our peace, our identity, our validation, our satisfaction, our joy. What are we building that upon? I'm guessing Jesus is there, but is there a plus sign in our lives? Because as long as there's that plus sign, we're going to be chasing something that we'll never attain. If you want the perfect marriage, you can have a great marriage. It won't be perfect. Two imperfect people can't make a perfect marriage. If you want the perfect friendship, if you want the perfect financial statement, if you want the perfect retirement, if you want the perfect job, if you want the perfect home, you're never going to find it. Is Jesus enough for our identity, our purpose, our joy, our contentment in life? And over these next many weeks, we're going to unpack the book of Colossians and come back to this theme in a variety of ways that Jesus is indeed enough. Let's pray. Hi, I'm Jennifer Mooney. Welcome to what is our new Hope Interrupted podcast based on the work from our book, Hope Interrupted, that I co-authored with my good friend, Byron McCauley. Hey, Jennifer, you know, I'm looking forward to this podcast as much as I was look, looking forward to writing this book with you. We hope to interview some uh, high impact folks as well as have a little fun. We're going to cover stories of hope. To learn more about our podcast and our book, please visit www.hopeinterrupted.com.